Okay. Which one's Marlene? Third yeah. one. Okay. Right there. Yeah. Okay. Longer hair. Well, we're all getting set up here. The reason we're all here, and we're very excited, is because of Merle Travis. And before we get into everything about Merle Travis, I feel like we should see a little, quick little video of what he, what he did better than anyone else. Let's roll it. This is a style of guitar playing that you've, you, you've known all your life, correct? I found it for sure when I was 18 years old. When I learned that Moles Rager was still alive over in Drakesburg, Kentucky. That was like going to Florida or something for us. We lived about 25 miles away over in Hopkins <laughs> County. And uh, Muhlenberg County was rough. <laughs> and everybody was afraid to go over. But uh, I learned about Moles Rager, so we went over and I started knocking on doors and asking where he lived. And he opened his door. And, looked at me and he said, boy, you're a box picker. I said, yes, sir. He said, get your box and bring me folks and y'all come on in. <laughs> and my whole world changed after that. But you know, if, you know, Moles had followed a fellow named Kennedy Jones around. And Kennedy Jones had uh, learned to uh, pick from his mother, who was a ladies parlor style player. And so Kennedy started playing and then the Kennedy's the first guy out of this line that found a thumb pick. He found it during the time that uh, the uh, Hawaiian guitar was getting popular in the United States and all. And so Kennedy saw those at a music store and he said, What's up? The guy said, uh, Well, there's something there for Hawaiian guitar. He said, well, Let me try one. He said, Let me have a guitar. He said, No, no, for Hawaiian guitar. He said, well, I'm not going to hurt it. Kennedy had made a blister on his thumb the night before trying to blow it out at a dance. <laughs> and so he bought, he ended up, he bought the whole box that the guy had. And, Sort of shared them around. Mose Rager, Nike, Everly were the two mm -hmm. best followers of, uh, of Kennedy, and then of course Merle followed both of them. Mm -hmm. Of course, Mose, your, your mentor, was one of two mentors for Merle, him and Ike Everly. Uh, from what I read in the book, Dee, he kind of just followed them around everywhere once he was a teenager. That sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> of course, Merle, I got to talk to him one time. He told me, he said, he says, if it hadn't been for Moles Rager, so I'd be picking up Lunium cans. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we'll learn. Uh, 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 Merle was a man of, of many talents. Um, uh, Eddie, do you mind picking something for us and just showing us an example of some thumb picking? Well, I have to be first here for all these good things. <laughs> Tom flew with me on this. Okay.
didn't see any Merle Travis records. I saw Chet Atkins records first, right? And people like Joe Memphis. Um, mm. and, um, and then a friend of mine who knew I uh, was listening to Chet Atkins records uh, said, oh, there's a guy next door and he's got this Merle Travis record. And I said, oh, can I come and listen to it, you know? So I remember, I think it was Blue Smoke was the first song oh. I heard Travis play. And then, and then I heard, you know, uh, uh, I Am a Pilgrim and uh, Nine Pound Hammer, uh, Guitar Rag, uh, Saturday Night Shuffle, you name it. O off I went. And uh, it was another world to me, even though uh, I could hear his influence in Chet's playing, he, he sounded different to everybody else. And, and uh, it was the first time that I was like, uh, it stopped me in my tracks. And, and I was like, I know what he's doing, but I just don't know why it feels the way it does. It feels so beautiful. And yet kind of, like, I, it almost sounded like he was playing to a bunch of people in a bar, like he was a honky-tonk piano player or something. He had something completely different. And, uh, and then when I got into his music a little bit later and, and in, into the songs that he wrote where he sang, I realized how clever his storytelling was and that his playing, even though it was incredibly iconic and way ahead, it, it was just a little part of the, the, the complete package. You know, uh, his clever writing, uh, uh, his clever way of saying things um, was, was so attractive to me. And like I, I, I was telling uh, Cindy and Merlene when I first got to know them, that when I, when I first went to places like China and Russia, everything changed when I went into a Merle Travis tune. The audience just lit up and went crazy. And boy, did I throw it at them. I threw everything I had at them, you know. And um, I made up medleys of Travis tunes and key changes and singing and then not singing and all this sort of stuff, just to find a way of, of uh, honoring him and, and taking what he gave to me and throwing it out there to the rest of the world because you can stand on it, it's rock solid. Saturday Night Shuffle. Oh, Saturday Night Shuffle, okay. <laughs> so, all right. Well, uh, uh, I'll see if I can butcher this for you. <laughs> <laughs> Honky Tonk, um, 
And they've been preserved really well, and Dad always felt very fancy when he would wear his nudie suits. But Nudie was a very good friend of mine, our dad's. In oh, fact, cool. his last marriage was at Nudie's house. So. Jamie was there. She was a little girl. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we just thought it would be fun to bring him out today. And this one was, where was this in? Yes, this one was in the, is, is still, I just borrowed it, um, in the Kentucky Music Hall of Fame in uh, Rip Pro Valley in Mount Vernon. And, uh, this with one of his Super 400 guitars is on display there. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, okay. Oh, yeah, you got to see that. You have to model. Here's the oh. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Been playing you. And it was acoustic when he first started playing it, and then he put it in the arm and put a pickup on it. That's where he worked. first went electric. And that's the guitar that he played on all of his early Capitol records. When you hear him playing electric guitar, that's the one. That's, he played that up until he got the Bigsby guitar in 1948. And then I don't think he liked the Bigsby guitar that much, so he kept playing that for another couple of years until he got the Super 400 in 1952. But how cool is that to see that guitar in person? And he was a, obviously a great picker. Everybody wanted to pick with him. And the first step he did for Capitol was for their transcription department. He recorded a bunch of guitar instrumentals on acoustic guitar that wind up getting reissued over and over and over again. A lot of people think they're from the 60s or later, but no, he actually recorded those in 1945 and 46. Mm. But then you mentioned he actually got signed as a proper Capitol recording artist in 1946. And a lot of people listen to those records and they have accordion on them and they have trumpet on them and not that much guitar picking. That was country music on the charts in 1946. I mean, you know, we always think about uh, Hank Williams and, and Lefty Frizzell and George Jones and all that kind of stuff. But in 1946, right after World War II, it was accordions and trumpets. I mean, that was the thing. Uh, and he had quite a few hits right off the bat with Capitol. Uh, really, his most productive time was probably that era right after he moved to Los Angeles set through the late 40s. Mm -hmm. And then another song that I think folks were singing backstage that might be among his biggest hits until we get to 16 tons is Divorce Me. COD. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and interestingly enough, uh, Cliffy Stone from Capitol didn't want to release it because the subject of divorce was quite taboo back then, but it, it's obviously such a clever song yeah. that they put it out. Do you, does anyone mind reciting or singing that, that, that yeah. song? Yeah. Was, well, Tommy was singing it earlier, I believe. The, the, there's also a typical Travis uh, cleverness of the lyric where it says, if you want your freedom, BDQ, which in those days stood for pretty darn quick. Right. You want your freedom, PDQ, divorce me, COD. Yeah. I think we have to explain to the young people what COD is. <laughs> <laughs> I love that picture, Dad, Capitol Records. When I was a little girl, I remember when Capitol was first built, because I'm really old. And he took me down there and said, look at that building, they built that in the shape of my records. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 16 tons. And uh, who else is here for Americana Week? So, I don't know how you guys do it. I've been here for four days. I've been talking to so many people in these loud clubs and everything. I, I woke up this morning and, and my voice kind of felt like raw hamburger and char you know, charcoal and gravel. And so, luckily this song is in a very low register. And I don't know if Buck Ford is out here. Tennessee, there he is. Okay, I'm going to sing this one for you. I hope I do it justice. Here we go. Be a B minor, like Tennessee Ernie. <laughs> Some people say a man is made out of mud. A bold man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood. Skin and bones. A mind that's weak and a back that's strong. You load 16 tons. What do you get? Another day older, deeper in debt. Say, Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I hold my soul to the company store. Can't interrupt that. I was born one morning when the sun didn't shine. I picked up my shovel and I walked to the mine. I loaded 16 tons. Number nine coal, the strong boss said, Will the bless of my soul, you load 16 tons. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. Say, Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I put my soul to the company store. I was born one morning, it was drizzling rain. Fighting 
damn trouble for my middle name. I was raised in the cane brick line all my little life. Can't no high tone woman make me walk the line. You load 16 tons. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I hold my soul to the company store. Alright, now since I started doing this book, I've been telling everybody that this is actually the first gangster rap song. <laughs> 1946, just listen. If you see me coming, better step aside. A lot of men didn't and a lot of men died. One fist of iron and the other is steel. If the right one don't get you, then the left one will. You load 16 tons, what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. I think I've ever heard uh, and uh, he was just such a great character an interesting guy and uh, I got to know him pretty well I remember when I first started coming here and staying out of Chet and Leona's house that uh, Chet said to me one day have you heard Tom Bresch and he's he's my old son you know and I said oh how does he play and he goes Ooh, good <laughs> Uh, he said, he plays some of my tunes better than I do. <laughs> but um, um, I, I wrote this song as a dedication to Tom, and I wrote it in a kind of Travis style, though when the bridge comes in, it sounds a bit like Stevie Wonder. And that's because I'm a different generation to Travis. And, um, so, so let me play it for you. I'll see if I can flog you a lick or two here, Eddie Pete. So, here we go, Son of a Gun for Tom. <laughs>
Can you tell me a bit about that, that song? Oh, well, that's just, that's one of the best known tunes that he ever played. It, uh, you know, it was written back in the 1920s, and uh, of course, Django Reinhardt had played it. Mm. Now, but when Merle come out and plays his version of it, you know, it changed the world for finger pickers. Everybody wanted to I'll see you in my dreams. That's kind of song. You mind playing it for us? We, that's what we played. Play. Oh, you already played that one, of course. Yeah. Glad you played that one. <laughs> but if you're going to have Eddie do another one, will you do Blue Smoke? I'll try. So this you is, know, this I, I'm, I'm old. I'm not like these guys. <laughs> I, have to, I have to warm up. When I went to Eddie's house, he said, oh, I, I'm not playing that much these days. I said, just show me how you play Blue Smoke, because I, I, don't, I don't really know how you're doing that role. And he busted out the most amazing version. I want to hear it again. Chet Atkins took his style from Merle and considered him his greatest influence. 
What would country music have been without Chet Atkins? And would young Chester Burton Atkins have become the great Chet Atkins without a burning desire to emulate his hero, Merle Travis? Capitol Records still does business at the Capitol Tower in Hollywood today. Likely most of the rappers and pop stars who pass through its hallways and the people who buy the records have no idea that Capitol wouldn't be in business today if Merle hadn't saved them from insolvency in 1947 when he wrote the blockbuster hit Smoke, Smoke, Smoke That Cigarette or that earnings from Tennessee Ernie Ford's 1955 hit version of 16 Tons paid for the construction of the now iconic Capitol Tower, which opened in 1956. That's it. I just wanted to cover how that We should also mention before I forget that you will be signing copies of this book up, up there in the, in the lobby when, when this That's is all right. through. That's right. But first, how about we do a little jam and then maybe we'll open things up for questions. Okay. He's got to get his, uh, he's got to... that if you, it had two speeds, that if you recorded it at the slow speed and then played it back at the fast speed, it went, it sounded incredible, like <laughs> And so when he signed to Capitol Records, he put out this record called Merle's Boogie Woogie. 
1947. And they did this all with disc recording. They didn't have tape recorders yet. And it's all this overdubbed, sped up recording. Interestingly enough, uh, Mary Ford's yeah. husband, Les yeah. Paul, he wound up putting out a record, very similar, same techniques, about four or five months later, a record called Lover, on the same label, Capitol Records. And Lover was a huge hit, Earl's Boogie Woogie was not. So within a couple of months, Cap Capitol Records is advertising Les Paul's guitar instrumentals as the new sound. But Merle did it first. <laughs> wow. yeah. Interestingly enough, that's kind of the only record like that he ever did. There's maybe one or two songs on the Strictly Guitar album that he did that on. But like a lot of things, you know, Merlene, I remember telling me this story. He'd get really fascinated by something and learn how to master it, and then he'd just drop it. <laughs> one time he uh, had come to visit his brother, Mr. John, up, Mr. John lived around Evansville, Indiana. And there'd come a big snow or something, so Merle was sort of caught there. And Mr. John had got a nice, you know, a real, real recorder for back in the day, back in the early 60s. And so Mr. John said, said Merle, why don't you record me some pretty tunes and all Stardust and things like that. So Merle did record it, but Merle said, how about do a little bit of Mickey Mouse stuff? That's what he, Merle called up overdubbing oh, Mickey so Mouse. He'd done some tunes like that. So it sounds like the chipmunks maybe owe a little bit to, to Merle. Yeah, actually, <laughs> same, same technique. Yeah. Maybe you told me this too. Yeah. Is that, you know, Chet Atkins did a thing where he basically played the bass with his thumb, like doom, 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 that sort of thing, and then he played the lead part on top of that. But what uh, Tom Bresch and, and Eddie told me is like, the way Merle Travis does it, it's really like he's got the bass, the rhythm guitar, and the lead guitar all going at the same time. You want to demonstrate it a little bit, slow it down like he was saying? <laughs> sat down on the couch and he had made this small bodied version of Merle's Super Bowl a ton. Basically of like mid 1940s grade Z Western. From here and to eternity. Performing in some of it. He's so in I forgot about that. He's, he was in a yeah. lot of stuff. Yeah. I think another funny story, won't keep it too much longer, but he um, would always tell me it's when he won the Hall of Fame and I was here in, Kentucky, or in Tennessee when he won it. And we were eating dinner, and people would come up to him and want his autograph. And I think it was the first time I went, they you know who Dad is? You know, I mean, it was like really astounding to me. It's and so the Dolly Parton story. Oh, yeah, well. So yeah. he came, I'll tell you that too. But this woman, or this guy came up, and he said, people always want you. He said, do you remember so-and-so? And he goes, I don't remember anybody. Right. So he came up and said, do you remember my uncle that you met at the fair in 1950-something? And Dad, and Dad said, oh, hell yes. <laughs> so, sure do. so anyway, I came up and I said, do you remember that guy, Dad? And he goes, no, I was playing Gene Autry. Gene always said, oh, just tell him, oh, hell yes. Makes him happy. Yeah. So, about 20 minutes later, this lady came back with the guy. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I've never seen Dad act so well. Life. Uh, yeah. But the Hall of Fame, when he was winning the Hall of Fame, we were all sitting in the front row and um, in between camera, they, people would come out and Dolly Parton came out. And I'd never seen Dolly in person. She was just gorgeous, waist this big and other things. Yeah. Really. yeah. <laughs> but she sat down on his lap and she put her arms around him and I mean, his face was right here. And she was yeah. going, oh, girl, I'm just 
rooting for you, and I think you're going to win the Hall of Fame. And he says, you know, Dolly, if I'd known you was going to be so famous, I'd have been nicer to you on the way up. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about that, I remember a thing Merle was talking about, you know, everybody would come up and say, Merle, you remember me? You know, maybe meet him one time to speak to something all. He said one night he was at this place to fix to do a show or something, there was a fence there or something, and the, all he could see was an eye looking through and he said, Merle, remember me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that might be a great place to leave it. Uh, Tommy Emanuel was playing. <laughs> Let's give one more round of applause to all of our participants today. Jimmy Travis, Jimmy Travis, Jimmy Travis, Jimmy Travis, and Tommy Emanuel, who has to be in the auditorium tonight, so he had to go to sound check. So we really appreciate Tommy coming and playing and talking with us. Thank you all so much, and thank you all for coming.